I, I, I kind of want to get going. You rolling? All right, man, this is exciting. We're starting production on For War to Wisdom, day one, shoot one. Josh, please state for the record your full name. Joshua R. Heisel. Place of birth. Cincinnati, Ohio. Underwear size. Large. <laughs> <laughs> All right, man. Are we live? We are live. Dude. <laughs> Could you match my, my yes. lackadaisical care for this? Yes, sir. What's going on? Be the one, Dan. All righty. First question. So from what I hear, it's just like Call of Duty. <laughs> <laughs> now, um, tell me a little bit about when you deployed. Tell me a little bit about where you're from, where you grew up. Yeah, where are you from? <laughs> I guess I'm supposed to say something, huh? <laughs> Fuck. What were you fighting for? What did we fight for? <laughs> That's a good question. I don't have that answer. <clears throat> and dude, if I'm going down paths that make you uncomfortable, or that I won't. I won't say anything. Path. I don't want to say. Don't. Can you not put that in either, dude? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what I'm saying? Sure, sure. I've told this story hundreds of times, but it's different every time I tell it. I swear. I, dude, I'm here. I'm I'm enjoying. I'm having fun right now, man. So let's let's keep it going, right, man. I wanted to be a Marine since I was a kid. I mean, I always did. I have papers and stuff from like fifth grade where I'm writing about being a Marine. Yeah, my grandfather, uh, Walter K. Heisel, was a Marine um, in Korea, Korean War. And uh, I always wanted to be a Marine ever since I was a child. I always look at my papa's pictures and stuff and he'd tell war stories and something very romantic about it, I don't know. You know, growing up, it's, you see it on TV, you play these games. I just want to do it, you know? You don't realize what it really is. Well, I was 19. Yeah, I think I was 19. Because I, I turned 20 uh, a couple days before I left for boot camp. So I knew I was 19 when I, when I swore in and stuff.
when 9-11 happened, I was at work when the towers got hit, and I left work and, like, uh, went and joined the Marines, like, right then and there. It was just an instant decision. And honestly, I didn't give it a lot of thought. I just did it, you know. There was, there was some other guys down there, too, that, that were, you know, the same thing. It was kind of a, this generation of uh, guys who were like, they want to kick somebody's ass. I don't, I don't know who, but everybody wanted some payback, I guess. I think people who join the Marine Corps are a certain breed of people, man. I would read books about like the Marines on Peleliu or, you know, what they did in Okinawa, the whole Pacific campaign, really. These guys are some fucking hard men and inspired me. I was like, I wondered if I could be that hard. I always wanted to be something bigger than myself. I always wanted to be the best and be in the best. I wanted to be in the Marines. It's the best branch. I wanted to be a grunt. Physical fitness of the United States Marines is traditional. Yet even the high bodily standards of our Leatherneck is being stepped up these days to meet new demands of modern warfare. The only thing I really knew about the Marines is they were supposed to be the toughest, they were supposed to be the hardest, you know. They had uh, commercials of them slaying dragons. I want to be the best. And so part of me was like, I'll be a Navy SEAL. And I realized I'm not too good of a swimmer. <laughs> so. Yeah, join the Marine Corps, you know, volunteered infantry. My recruiter was like, what do you want to do, you know, as an enlisted person? I was like, well, obviously infantry, I want to, you know, blow stuff up and kill people. Why would I join the Marine Corps to do other stuff? Well, the Marine Corps is legendary for being badass, man. I mean, every major battle in the history of of all of our wars, uh, they've taken they've taken people down, man. We learned by fire real fast, even while we were in training. You know, you're taking 18-year-olds, and then by the time they're 19, they're all marathoners and capable of hiking large amounts of goods through mountain passes, you know, and, and employ weapon systems. You know, there's a big change in such a small amount of time. It was just always something that I knew I was going to end up doing at one point in my life. Now we're going to war. Hopefully it holds out till I can get there, right? That was my train of thought, dude. Hopefully it, it can hold out till I get there. of war began turning, and so everything changed. It was, there was something palpable in the air. Everybody knew that something was coming. I mean, we were going to war. We didn't know what kind of war. We didn't know how long it was going to last. We didn't know if we were even going to fight it. You know, we might just have been flown into Kuwait, you know, rattled our saber, and then got to go home. Nobody knew. but. We were going, and we were going now. Rock and roll. Hey, quit your log gag and get your stuff and let's go. Welcome to Kuwait. This is as real as it's gonna get. In fact, it's worse because we can't see the enemy. Good to go? Uh, Nobody gets off the bus. We left in late January and uh, arrived in Kuwait in buses. They bust us out in the middle of the night, like three, four, five hours out in the middle of the night uh, into the Kuwaiti desert. We finally roll up uh, off of sandy roads to this one generator just in the middle of nowhere. I mean, there's nothing. And uh, they, we get out and they, they tell us to unpack and we're just, you know, biv bivouacking here tonight. 
and uh, we all just kind of we put up set up a fire watch and we wake up under like six inches of sand. A sandstorm comes in the middle of the night and buries everybody while they're sleeping. Welcome to the fucking suck. You know what I mean? And all of a sudden we can see around us. You know it's morning time and uh, there's just nothing but sand. Slowly rolling sand for as far as you can see. We didn't know where we were at. They were like we're somewhere in Kuwait. Does anybody really know where we are? Do you guys know where we are? Which way is Iraq? No. And then it wasn't until later that uh, after we dug into fighting holes like World War II all over again, but it, thank God it was sand to dig in, we realized that we were like two clicks from the border. You know, we were staring at the Iraqi border just waiting to go, and that's where we spent the first month. And it, it still hadn't sunk in. Nothing had happened yet. You weren't really on edge. It waited us to death, you know, that'll make somebody go stir crazy. It's like, we're over here for a war, and then they just park us over there. Hurry up, get over there. And then they're like, all right, now we're just going to sit here. And we, we have no idea what we're going to do and when we're going to be doing it, by the way. So, and that'll just, that'll drive a man insane. Oh, Blake, that looks like a little bit of heaven there, huh? You don't you even know, Mike. Where'd don't get, even know. Where'd you get that from? First Sergeant hooked me up. First Sergeant did that? He did. War be to the devil dog who drops the pot. Huh? It seems to be the most critical piece of tackle equipment you have here, first sergeant. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Think about it. You know, you train to go do something, you want to do it, right? So we're excited. And we sat in Kuwait for a couple of months. Uh, I think it was a solid two months. Um, and it got to the point where it was a whole lot of poker and checkers and uh, really nothing, uh, you know, gas drills. But no, it turned into this, like, you know, very uh, complacent thing where we were just kind of camping out, you know, the desert. Mr. al said Iraq was committed to abandoning banned weapons and accused the United States of possessing ulterior motives. I, I think we shouldn't be over here unless we're going to go across the LD because, I mean, we're shock troops. We're not people to stand here and just sit here because that's just not what Marines do. No, gas masks suck, but... Okay. Oh. What we try to tell the Marines, what I try to tell the staff and SEALs and the Marines directly is it doesn't matter what our politics, what's, what's happening politically or anything. The only thing that matters is what's happening to our company today. So shake it off and let's get our heads in the game. That way we can all come home. We're just another chapter in, in a long legacy of you know, great Marines doing what they had to do. And it's our duty to not to drop the flag, so to speak. And, and they understand that. And that's part of being a Marine. It's, it's taught since recruit training. Every unit you go to has a history and they'll always tell you, we have to you know, keep our legacy strong, keep our honor clean so we can pass it on to the Marines that come behind us. The Marine Corps is built to fight from the fire team level up. My position as first sergeant in this company, I work on leadership because um, if we can build them in as strong leaders, then all those bad decisions or less favorable decisions will start to just drop off. They won't exist because they'll take the time to think about their Marines first and then they'll make better decisions. So I want to develop their maturity as Marine leaders. We were attached to second tanks, and uh, they could bring cool stuff over in their tanks. And somebody had a guitar. I wake up, but I don't know the date. I just know that I'm in Northern Kuwait. But later on, after the attack, we're gonna get online and police call Iraq. There's this motto in the Marine Corps, when we're not killing, we're chilling. So we sat out and would like write songs about how hot it was and how shitty it was. And we had this little talent show in the desert. And uh, first sergeant comes up and tells me, you know, you're gonna, you're gonna do something tonight to represent Fox. So I did and I won the freaking thing. 
Thanks a lot, Fox. Thanks, everybody else. And then one night, man, about two in the morning, they just were freaking, let's go, boys. You've waited your whole Marine Corps career. Some of you have only been a year, some of you have only been two years. Some of you Devil Dogs have spent longer for this moment right here. Don't screw it up, you understand what I'm saying? You've trained so hard to get to this point. Now it's time to go do what we need, what we train to do. Jack, let's go get some. All of a sudden we're invading Iraq and we're going through them and you're like, oh, here we are, like we're here. And of course we're expecting D-Day, you know what I mean? Just bullets. And as we went up the country there through the south, it was just white flags, that was it. I mean, there were whole units surrendering. It wasn't until around the Fertile Crescent when we got out of the desert and into some foliage, we got attacked, you know, by Republican Guard. Saddam's good, you know, elite. They weren't very elite, I mean, we, we trashed them pretty quick. Uh, we'd get hit by somebody, we'd buckle down and, and you know, our Cobra helicopters would just cut them to pieces and we move on um, but um, you know April 4th uh, that was that was the day it all got real Morning, Frank. How you doing? Pretty good, pretty good. Getting cleaned up for the big town? Oh, I can't wait. Big day is coming in. Here it comes. I want, I want to get this stuff over with. This is our last step Baghdad, so... There ain't much to go from there. This is a long trip, but I tell you what, it's, uh... It'll be worth it when we get up there. Think it's going to be easy or tough today? Can't say. Uh, wish I knew. Yeah. Even the magic eight ball doesn't know. Even it, the magic eight ball doesn't know. Yesterday was a little wild, wasn't it? I had a little bit of fun yesterday. Yeah. But at the end of the day, it's always it's always good to know that you're the good guy. Yeah. So, as long as I can go home with that, I'll be a happy man. Let's go get him loaded. of leaving our lines, we were hit again. For the third straight day, we're taking contact from a main Iraqi brigade stationed on the main road leading into Baghdad. We only have 32 miles to go to Baghdad. It looks like we're going to be fighting all the way up. We were driving down the road, and we got hit by this like couple piss-shooting couple guys. And we all got out. We're trying to find them. It was three dudes. And uh, I was a designated marksman at the time. So I lay down and I find this guy running and I pop a shot off and I hit him and he fell down and he, you know, crawls in the doorway or whatever. I thought I missed him. I really thought I missed him. I thought he just, you know, dropped. And I find out, you know, a couple hours later, the snipers went out and said, you got that son of a bitch. And I remember I was like stoked, 
But at the same time, it was like, damn, man, I fucking just killed somebody. You know what I mean? I just killed this guy. And I don't know him. I don't know what he looked like, how old he was. You know, maybe he had liver cancer and I put him out of his misery. But doubtful, you know, I killed a fucking kid, you know, just like me. So whatever, we move on. And uh, there's not really time to process that shit. You go, all right, cool. Good job, good job. move on we got ambushed hard and uh first sergeant smith got killed um and that was all of our hero i mean this guy was he made us what we were he got us ready for this fight and to see him get killed uh this invincible force was fucked up i don't know what's going on you know i'm just getting through the day you know fucking shooting it you know anything that pretty much moved half the time when when he got hit, I mean, it rocked my world. I heard, like I heard, you know, you hear the radio call, you know, Fox 8 hit. And like, all I could say was just, you know, fuck. And I'm sitting in the Humvee, you know, and I look in the side mirror, and I see them carrying his body on the stretcher, and they're taking him to the helo. The helicopter's blowing everybody, all the wind and dust around, and it was kind of a sandstormy kind of day, and there was still smoke and stuff from invasion fires and, you know, things burning around us, BMPs, the smell of flesh in the air. That was tough to see, because I didn't know who it was at first. And then, especially when I look back, for, for a man that was a mentor to me, and just, I mean, an amazing Marine, and the last time I ever got to see him was in the side mirror of a Hummer on a stretcher. There was no grieving time, you know. We had to keep going, we had a job to do. And ultimately, at the end of the day, I think our first sergeant would have been proud of us. So we had to push on after that. The war became real. That was it, man. Everyone was like, Shh. and all, you saw it. No one was smiling. Nobody was dicking around. And everybody got very, very serious and very, very old very quickly. For me, it ended up being becoming, over the course of the weeks and months, it became like a symbolic thing for me. Our, our figurehead, you know, the, the top of the pyramid was knocked off, but, some, you know, everybody just, like nothing happened, just filled right in and just took over and it just kept running like the machine that it is. I mean, it's closest thing I can akin it to is uh, like the phalanx in ancient Sparta, when they, they moved as one unit and no matter what happened, everybody knew everybody's job up and down the chain of command. Oh, God damn it, you, hey, hey, look at me. you know, if it ended up being a private in charge of the, the entire group, he knew the job. And that, that's what made it so special for uh, for me personally and for the Marine Corps as a brotherhood in general and the armed forces in general. I just will never forget that day. I mean, because the events that evening piled on and piled on and piled on. It seems like once that domino fell, it didn't stop. We just got shit on for the next, you know, two months until, until you know, they surrendered completely. But, uh, it's, it's funny because in relation to the romance of being a kid and wanting to go to war, and you know, you, you think, I mean, you really want to go, you think you know what you're talking about, but until it happens, man, you don't, you don't know. And when it does happen, it's like, psh, Jesus fucking Christ, man, I shouldn't have done this. This isn't for me, you know? 
But that's you know, but it's not that's not the scariest part. The scariest part is when that feeling goes away and you start to like it. Then next thing we know, we're in Baghdad. And it's like, never thought in my life I'd be sitting in Baghdad. And, you know, we obviously, you know, we met resistance. But, I mean, nothing stopped us. We were there for them. They waved at us. They chased us. They were, they loved us. I mean, we literally set them free, you know. We went in with a mentality of hearts and minds. Uh, no better friend, no worse enemy. And we, we truly embodied that, I feel like. You know, we said, we are here, you know, we're not here to oppress you. Like, we're just gonna keep ourselves safe. And other than that, like, if you want to, you know, work with us, we will help schools, we'll help your children, we'll help you get food, we'll help you get water. You know, we will do anything and everything we can to help you. But if you, if you come against us and cross us, the iron fist comes down, and there is no half measure. We will obliterate you. Marines don't fight for an administration or a country or a flag. Marines fight for Marines. And that's why we're so successful. We believed in each other. Everybody had each other's back. It was a new experience for everybody involved. But we knew that if we were there together, we would conquer it because nothing could conquer us. So you get out and you go back home and that support structure is gone. The support structure of your friends, your brothers, all of a sudden it's just gone. And because we were, I think we were the first ones over there, we didn't realize that things were, that things would be different. It's like you walk into civilian society and you just don't get it anymore. It just, like, does, does not compute. What are these people, like, would they give a shit about something? I mean, it's like, just a little while ago, like, if I was alive at the end of the day, and I wasn't bleeding, and if none of my buddies, that happened to none of my buddies, that was a good day. And if there was food, plus one, you know? If there was an op a working fan, huh, I mean, you're, you're set, you're living the life of luxury. Your general American, the your general civilian, never had to make a sacrifice for what went on over there. I'll never fault a man and I'll never weep for a man who, who died doing what he chose to do. If you're doing what you love and you die doing it, then God bless you and hey fucking men, you know what I mean? It's, isn't that the way you wanna go out? My biggest issue uh, that I found was handling Marines that survived. 
when I first got back from Iraq, you know, I, I expected to be different. You know, I, I expected if you go uh, into a combat zone, into such a high stress, high, you know, adrenaline everyday type environment, um, that when I came home, it was going to take a while to kind of readjust back to relative safety. And, uh, you know, I thought maybe, hey, six months, a year after getting home, maybe then I'll start to be more like the old me. And, uh, you know, it took a few years to really realize that that's not going to happen. It was like, what did I do over there? Why did I do this? You know, and you try to regurgitate this information to your loved ones, and that's where it all kind of went downhill. Um, your family and your friends, as much as they love you, they just don't understand, you know? If I had a chance, would I do it again? I would do it all over again to be able to be there for my brothers. Would I be there for political reasons and bullshit and the lies that we were told? No, I wouldn't be there. But would I be there for Josh, for Langley, for First Sergeant? Yes. Heartbeat. After the first tour, I got home and got married right away. Um, we'd been planning it through letters throughout the war. Um, I mean, I threw on my dress blues, got married a couple days after I got home. And then when we found out we had to do a second tour in Ramadi um, to kick these guys back out of there, I, you know, we'd lost control of it and gotten all fucked up again. Um, I had a son at this point. Um, when we got the call to leave, it was down to the down to the wire on the birth date. Like, uh, I, I, I was deployed two weeks after he, my son Holland was born. Throughout the pregnancy, prior to his birth, I was training new Marines, kids who just gotten out of infantry school, you know, just like I was a year and a half before that. And uh, that, was, that was hard because I'm looking at these guys and I know that I was the same idiot that they were. Um, didn't know anything, you know, about war, about anything. And, I, and I'm thinking to myself, like, I'm training these guys, you know, half of them are gonna fucking die. You know, and I'm watching the news, and you, you saw what was going on in Fallujah, Ramadi. It's like, you know what you're dropping into. And you try to tell them that, you try to train them for that, but it's a tiny city. So you're not gonna like avoid shit. Like, you're going to Ramadi, you're going to Ramadi. The company I went to was uh, called the Blackhearts. That was our nickname. In boot camp, you, you learn general Marine Corps knowledge, right? And you hear, okay, 2nd Battalion, 5th Marines is the most decorated unit in the, in the Marine Corps. All right, so I find out that I'm going to 2-5 and I'm stoked, dude, you know? There was a legacy. These dudes uh, had just got back from the invasion. So these guys had all been in the fight and we're just these young infantry Marines who were like, this is what we signed up to do. So these guys were like our heroes, right? And uh, being Blackhearts, they, they instilled an ethos almost into us. And they made us earn that title. And I think that's why we functioned so well when we finally got into Ramadi, because we had this, this identity as Blackhearts. And that's who we had to live up to.
بليز بليز تحت انت بليز واي واي هاسبن واي When we left the first tour in Iraq, we were, we were, it was parades. It was people thanking us. And we were all throwing up peace signs and you know, this thing was over. And the people were kissing us and shit, like, you know, liberators. When we got there to Ramadi, the combat outpost, and the guys we relieved, they'd been getting their asses kicked for about, you know, six months. They didn't even have advice for us. They just were like, get me out of here. So we went on a couple patrols and, uh, and I don't know if they hated us or if they were just scared shitless. But uh, it wasn't like when I left Iraq the first time. When I left the first time, it was like, you know, you we're getting hugs and kisses. Uh, this time it was very, we'd walk down the road, everybody went in the house, you know, locked down. And we'd get hit, you know, we'd get ambushed. And that's just how it was. When we were over there, it's like, just because this city is quiet right now, <laughs> it doesn't mean anything. This city will pop off in a heartbeat, man. In a fucking heartbeat, it just, turns like that and it feels like the whole city's on top of you. Whoa! How about that shit? Holy shit, that that guy's down, man. Down, man. Holy shit. <laughs> that is the motherfucking window that saved my life. Fuck man, we were we I don't I don't even know how to explain it because I don't want to use too strong of words. But we were, we were, we just fucked people up. I mean, it just was crazy. We had a license to pretty much <laughs> do whatever you want. Marines are killers, man. That's what we are. We create hellfire. That's what we do. That's probably the biggest mistake we made is uh, sending, you know, 100,000 Marines to, to police Iraq. You don't send killers to keep the peace, man. You don't. I know fortunate world. I'll never forget getting hit and they told us we've got two different rooms, all right? One room is for people that are gonna live when they're injured and you bring them to that room. And the gym, the gym is expectant. Gym means you ain't gonna make it. And the first night that we brought guys back into the expectant room, the screams from that room that's when reality sits in. You know, that guy's not gonna pull through. That was the same guy that the night before I was up on a turret with, you know what I mean? And I mean, where is he gonna be tomorrow? You know. And that's really the, the first death. The first death is when it really sinks in. My thoughts out here really are just, this is my job, this is what I do. If I die, I die. As simple as that, you know. I basically have told everyone back home, until I come back home, just consider me dead. 
you know, this way, you know, and that's how I operate out here. I keep going, take a route ahead. I went to the ground, pulled me back, looked at myself real quick, make sure I wasn't bleeding, kept going. And that's what you got to do. You got to keep pressing, uh, not only for yourself, but for the platoon, for the company to, uh, to finish the mission. So out here, and see how you hear the things whizzing by you, things are blowing up around you, but it's instilled in you to continue on, to not falter. It's, it's just second nature for us. That pilot done it. I can almost guarantee you that was an IED. You've been driving down these little back roads. You've got all these different alleys. Anytime an RPG gunner can pop out and just, just hit us with one. This is the ghetto OP here. I've been trying to get a frisbee for fucking since we've been here. Well, I'll tell you what, when we left the first time, I never thought I'd be coming back. And uh, when we left, it was pretty peaceful. And when we came back, it was crazy. So, I don't know. I'm actually having a ball, but it's a little different. This time I left a wife and a kid, whereas last time I left a fifth of Jack. You know? This time, yeah, I'm definitely watching my own ass a little bit more. Just because I want my kid to have a dad. I don't know, I'm pretty psyched to go home and get out of the Marine Corps, but now we have time to do things like this, what we should be doing. Help these people out, boost their morale, boost their confidence, so they can help us finish this thing off. Because that's what it's going to take, is I reckon people will help us. The first day back in the States, there's signs all over the highway coming in through Fallbrook. Welcome home to five, welcome home to five, there'll be somebody's name or something like that, you know? They hold this formation, we march up there all super motivated, everyone's marching in time, calling like that old drill instructor cadence, you know? And raggedy ass camis and shit. And uh, people are taking pictures of us and that's like actually one of like the proudest I've ever felt my entire life, man. Coming back and everyone's like cheering for you and shit, you know? After a couple days of being home, it's like, well, fucking now what? You know what I'm saying? Man, you should have known. You can't go home. You can't go home.
home You're smiling like roses But you're made from stone You can't go home You can't go home You're living life lovely But you're on your own You can't go home You can't go home Again, love you so This is my area. It's not insomnia, it's duty. That's what I say. I stay up so that I can watch the whole complex go to sleep and then I can go to sleep. Sitting on my porch, man. This is where I go every night. You gotta have a spot you can retreat to. It's gotta be your spot, you know, where you're kind of in control, you know. And most of the guys I talk to, they have that same shit, like their basement or their fucking backyard or whatever. You gotta have a place to decompress every day. Cause at the end of every day, I'm full to the limit with stress and whatever. You have no fucking idea what it's like to not be able to sleep, man. It wears on you, and you start to go, I'm a burden to my family. I'm a burden to myself. I'm a burden to everybody. I should just fucking shoot myself. I don't know, man. The long arm of the American government. I, that was me. That's who I was, man. I was the fucking judge, jury, and executioner. And it, I didn't like it. I still don't like it. But I don't regret it. I feel like there's a part of myself over there. You know, and that's why I went back my like after my first combat tour. When I decided to go back, I felt I needed to, man. I still feel that. Whatever it was I was doing over there, it's not fucking done yet. I mean, I'm home and I know I'm not getting shot at anymore. No one's like really trying to kill me. But I don't think you can ever really, I don't know, man. I don't think anybody ever really comes home. Being unarmed bugged the shit out of me. I had to have, I had to have some kind of weapon nearby. Um, I couldn't sleep. Falling asleep was this ordeal. I'd be tired and I'd lay down and I'd lay there for two hours. My mind would just go and go and go. The biggest hurt for me was, you know, I ruined people's lives. I arrested people that I didn't even know were terrorists. You know, I, I took fathers away from children. I took children away from fathers. And not only that, but I permanently took children away from fathers. You know, I mean, we pulled the fucking trigger. You know? There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. You know, a killer's a killer, period. It 
so the first few years were tough. You know, I spent a lot of time drinking. You know, I got into trouble with the law. You know, and uh, I spent a little time in jail. And for me, it was basically, um, you know, coming out of jail and getting into the VA and realizing you know, the way I'm doing it's not working. You know. When I first got back, you know, I had a lot of rage issues. I would, you know, my first apartment that I had, there were so many holes in the walls, you know, just trashed my car. I, I punctured the tires on my own car one time because I was pissed off. Dented, you know, the side of it, broke a window. Um, I broke my own bones, pulled a shotgun on a neighbor one time, spent, you know, almost a night in the custody of the Long Beach Police Department. Um, I just, you know, I struggle with rage in a big way and it ruined relationships for me and, and strained other relationships for me and put me to a place where I kind of did draw off by myself and get very alone and, and lost contact with all but a couple of people. I've been on 32 different types of medications, antipsychosis to heavy narcotics, tranquilizers, all the way down. The pill taking point was my love. I mean, you know, th that's when I actually put a, a bullet or a, a, a gun in my mouth, you know? Loaded up a fucking a Glock right in front of my wife and you know, told her, this is it. I don't have anything else to live for. And, you know, it's, it's then that after that moment, the look that I've seen in my wife's eyes, I've never seen before. And it's, it was a look of, you know, of her being scared. I've never seen her scared before, not, not like that. And i never forget, I took that right on out the mouth. And I haven't done it since, you know what I mean? And from that moment on, you know, I realized I need help. I didn't want to be defined as you know, a Marine or combat Marine. But what I realized after 10 years is that is a part of you and it does define you. And it's something that for a long, long time I tried to put in the background, shake off, whatever you want to call it. And it was a real moment actually, a real moment of clarity for me um, not too long ago, about a year ago, uh, speaking to a Vietnam veteran who basically said, son, that never goes away. That's just the way it is. You're gonna have to learn to, to deal with it. I got out of the Marines uh, Thanksgiving day about five. You're at home, you're safe, and you're sitting there with your kid and your wife, you know, and it was really over. That's, that's my mom and that's you. I saw the man on his worst day, and you know, I'm glad I did it because now I know exactly what to teach my son. You know, I, I know exactly what to tell him, and I know exactly how to treat him when, you know, when he wants to go do that crap, you know. And, and I can write music about it, and I can, uh, I suffered a little bit, but I can I can help a lot of people, I think. And you said, boy, <laughs> all you can do in this life is survive. And that ain't no lie. So go home now and tell your mom all you love. Grab your lady and her and stay. Towards the middle of that tour of Ramadi, I started to really have an issue with the way we were handling things. Um, the, the whole the interruption of people's lives, I had a huge problem with. If you tell, start bitching to your men about it, you're just a useless squad walking around. So I'd use my guitar as an outlet, you know, to, to bitch and complain uh, about the way things were going. And this way, the, the boys aren't hearing me uh, talk trash about about the war and about the administration we were under. As, as we would get hit really bad or lose someone or someone would get wounded, um, 
all this music became reflective suddenly. Uh, the, the funny stuff ended just immediately. Uh, that's when I became a songwriter right then and there. I started playing music with a local band, uh, just having fun. And I was getting ready for a gig in Cincinnati. Um, and I get the phone call from Mike Sarek. And he was a journalist that was embedded with us in Iraq. And uh, he called me and said, hey, you know, you know who Neil Young is? I'm like, yeah, yeah, I know who he is. So he's like, I'm doing this movie for him, CSNY Deja Vu. And he's, uh, he's really into your music and stuff, man. He wants, to, he wants you to come up and play with him and stuff when he comes through town. And I'm like, what? Here's the man. Hey, Josh. 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 And, and it's just been going on ever since. Thank you. And it's a real pleasure for me to introduce this friend of mine, a guy that's in our movie, uh, Deja Vu. Uh, he's, a, he's a soldier that was in Iraq twice. He's a songwriter. And he's here tonight to play for you. His name is Josh Heisel. And he'll be playing with his accompanist, Jennifer Wheatley. So how about a big hand for Josh and Jennifer? What happened was, once we started hitting the road and started sharing this music, I suddenly became this, this guy that all these vets wanted to talk to. We'd have all these vets in the crowd and, and they'd be talking to us afterwards about how we keep them, you know, we're keeping them alive or, or uh, you know, they can listen to our music and, and be all right and feel all right and they can relate to everything. So it just turned into something real powerful, man. And then when that ha once that happens, man, once you decide that that you care about these people, you're married to it forever, you know. After Josh got out and he started getting, you know, a little famous touring with Stills and Nash and all those guys, CNN did a piece on, on him and uh, he was singing, I think that song was Traitor's Death or something like that. And uh, CNN was doing this piece about, you know, just the whole anti-war thing. And I'm still in, man. I'm getting ready to go back again. And uh, I saw that shit and I was like, fucking Heisel, dude. I'm Fuck that guy, dude. How could you do that? If you want a man to fight, you must first tell him what he's paid. Then tell him with this uniform you're surely to get laid. And teach to him the gospel, it's a sin not to be brave. 
bail me out Oh, someone bail me out I was so mad at him for like the longest time, dude. And then I like, I, I came across some of his other, th I think it was that song, Bail Me Out. And this is a fucking pretty righteous song, man. You know, and especially after I got out and started looking at things more objectively. And, uh, you know, I started like, well, I like, pretty much agree with him. It took me several friends and combat tours to figure out that they don't give a fuck about the bodies in the ground. But they build us marble statues and berate us on the town. Bail me out. Oh, someone bail me out. My biggest hope is that people can listen to my music and see a painted picture of A, what you're gonna have to do if you go over there and the things that you're gonna encounter and B, what you live with for the rest of your life after you do it. If you can listen to music or watch a film and educate yourself and know what you know these horrors of war without having to go do it. That's the mission, man, that's the mission. My pleasure, man. What a perfect night for Josh Heisel to be sharing his music with us. Make welcome and celebrate the 4th of July with Josh Heisel. In 2008, I did Sundance with uh, Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young. Uh, it was really cool. After that ended, I started looking for gigs. Came home and was running on the road with Mikey Ronstadt. And uh, we got a call from Walt Michael, who runs uh, a music and arts festival called Common Ground of the Hill. And he hired us in to, to tell our story um, and to, to play music and to teach music. And it's a great gig. He's like, it's a whole week. And you live on a college campus, you get paid, you get fed. And I get there, and it's just this incredible community of people who truly took me in. Um, and even though I was teaching, I was learning so much, uh, making some of the best friends in my life. And um, I started to heal as a result of Common Ground on the Hill. Oh, I'd rather be a killer than a no good fair weather friend. Killer than a no good 
Common Ground on the Hill was founded um, in 1994, and the idea was to bring together artists and to foster dialogue among artists about day-to-day, boots-on-the-ground issues for all of us in our society. At the same time, we celebrate our arts, and um, we believe that a healthy society is one that has its arts happening. Josh Heisel came to us, I think, four years ago, and I was immediately uh, blown away by his songs and his ability, and not only ability, but his uh, need to speak freely and to speak truth. And I felt like we needed to hear that. And I feel that our country and our world needs to hear this. We take the warriors who, um, who serve us, who serve our countries. And we train them and they do their work as requested. And then we forget about them. We honor them. Uh, in, in this generation, we're honoring these people. But I'm not sure we follow up right. And I'm not sure that um, unless we hear their stories, and allow them to be okay with their stories, that we're doing our jobs as citizens. We were asked to come back a second year and a third year. After a while, I decided that this was helping me. This was helping me uh, psychologically. I was feeling worth something again. I was, you know, I was feeling like I was contributing again. I was writing music that, I wasn't just complaining about my woes anymore. I was writing music um, that was helping me, it was healing me, my own soul. And their music was healing my soul. I just want to thank you guys from the bottom of my heart for bringing me in here four years ago and saving my life. It changed the game for me completely. War changes you, period. It helps me a lot to hear what everyone's thinking. You know what I mean? It helps me to, to know what, how you guys feel. So I just wanted to thank all of you and give yourselves a huge round of applause. Go ahead, give it up for yourself. You guys are awesome. I knew that if this could help me, it could help uh, other veterans. So naturally I reached out to Black Hearts, people I knew, that I knew had been in contact, that I knew were having a hard time, or could or I think could benefit from this. We formed the Vets Initiative, uh, Common Ground on the Hill, three years ago. Bringing veterans, scholarship and veterans, and bringing them to Common Ground on the Hill in various places, uh, Westminster, Maryland, here in Gettysburg, as well as Tucson, Arizona. And the idea is to uh, reintegrate warriors, returning warriors, back into civilian society through arts and music, and, um, and, and classroom programming. And uh, you know, we raise money throughout the year, uh, just guerrilla style to bring these guys in, and uh, it's been successful thus far. Heisel, he called me, and he told me about this uh, Common Ground event. He told me that, it started, just kind of told me something about, oh, there's this like festival, and there's uh, uh, music, there's uh, trade skills, classes. 
I talked to Blakely for a little bit and he explained to me what, what Common Ground was and I couldn't pass it up. First time Hans told me about it, I, <laughs> I looked at the video and I was like, what the fuck is this? I mean, it was, it was a hippie fest, you know? It was like, those artists, like, dude, I don't play no music. What, what the hell am I gonna do here? Obviously, it was a little bit of culture shock at first, uh, but since I've been here over the last few days, I think it's imperative that veterans are here so that everybody else can have a more educated opinion on what we are doing when we're in, what we're doing when we get out, and that we're just people too. Don't knock it till you try it. That's really the only, the only way you can explain it because it's not until you get here that you realize that people still care about you. Those of you in here who aren't combat veterans, you're in here for a reason. You're in here to understand that we're in here with you to understand. Uh, we're in here to bridge the gap, you know. When you come back, being 23 years old when I got out of the army, all of my friends, I mean, they're just getting done finishing up their bachelor's degree and I don't even know how to conduct myself like a normal human being <laughs> when I'm being reintroduced to society. My friends are like, what is wrong with you? Why are you driving 110 miles an hour dodging bags of trash blown across the road? And it, it's incredibly hard for them to empathize with what we've been through. There'll be no shortage of suicides this year. There'll be no shortage of wars in the future. And just remember that it's gonna, there's gonna be a lot more boys and girls to take care of that are coming back. And there, there were a couple of other classes that I thought about taking and uh, something just drew me to this. Um, I, I guess it's the need to understand more. You know, we love to say support our troops and oh, I support our vets, but you know, flag waving and all that kind of stuff, is <laughs> that's not going to do too much. I think we have a real responsibility to, to do more, to get to know them and to, uh, to find out how we can help them. To get their perspective just puts everything in a whole different light, uh, which I'm going to take away from me and you know, remember forever, really. One of the cool things about the Veterans Initiative is uh, the cast the vets that come. You got a lot of young Iraq guys that are really having a hard time and trying to find some way up and out. And then you got Ragtime, Vietnam era Marine. He's found this level of peace and he's like a great mentor to the younger guys. And sometimes just being in contact with other, with other warriors, um, that's all you need, just to be in touch again, just to be able to talk to someone who speaks your language. Well, as you can see, we're making a totem pole for everybody. Uh, we're hopefully going to represent everybody that, that came with us in the initiative. Uh, we got Fox 25's insignia. Old Ragtime is an old former Marine. He wanted a peace symbol, so he's been working on his peace symbol and getting everybody started in it. I make music with a file. They make music with a guitar. It's all, it's all the same thing. Each one is art. It's just art in a different direction. <laughs> It's almost surreal because it's 10 years of time that have gone by since I've seen a lot of these people. You know, uh, it's been a long road, I guess you could say. Uh, you, you either choose to reinvent yourself and change along the way or you, you get stuck in the mire and that's those are the guys that we're trying to help. And, you know, just show them that it's okay to look forward. It's okay to not be the quintessential tough guys. It's okay to, to not have to think about it every day you know you're not doing any of the people that were left behind in injustice by putting their memory away because if they were alive they'd tell you why aren't you living your life why aren't you keeping going why aren't you expressing yourself you know so you can either let it destroy you or you can take it and use it to heal the world and so that's what this place is all about and i absolutely love it When I got back from Nam, I didn't want to be that person that I was. I didn't like him very much. And um, ragtime came about as I was just searching for an identity. I heard that 
on a song by the band called Rock and Chair. Not going to sail the seven seas anymore. He's going to sit on his porch with his, rock, with his old friend Ragtime. And, and I heard that name and just who I became. It just was so cool. I felt that that's who I was. Being an artist was quite a shift. It seemed very strange that, that that was kind of my path was going to be into art rather than violence or killing or something like that. It just uh, my whole past life hadn't been going towards art at all. I avoided it with extreme prejudice, and um, now I wanted to be an artist, but I still don't really think of myself as that. I'm still just basically a grunt that does some things well. Well, this is a piece I did about 15 years ago when I um, was just starting to be diagnosed with PTSD. The head is a mass of disorganized matter. And the hair, it swirls between chaos and order. The shoulders are crying deep blue water, and the neck is a simmering volcano. And that's how life was for a while. There's golden beams coming in to try to diffuse the disorganization in there and bring healing. I guess that's what this is going to try to put the pieces back together. It took 30 years until they started recognizing PTSD. And so all those years in there, I went through a marriage, I went through a lot of things, you know, and it's like, I didn't know what was wrong with me. And when the first night I got to common ground, it was just like all these guys and all this energy that I hadn't felt in that mass for a long, long time. I loved it. I feel like I'm over the hill, man. But I can still have a few shots in. I can help the younger bucks with, but they got to be there too. And that, that's why I want to be a part of Common Ground because there's people actually walking the walk. I do feel that I have not lived in vain. Maybe somewhere down the road, someone will look at my life and say, well, Ragtime wasn't drinking the Kool-Aid. War sucks. There's never been a good war or a bad peace. As far as being a warrior goes, I'm very proud that I was able to accomplish that in my life and, and feel good about that. But what I did with that was not good at all. I don't like what we did to the Vietnamese people at all. It's uh, put a hole in my soul that's still there. It ain't over yet, and I've been a grunt for since 1963. It's okay to be a warrior that strength is not to fight. And I'm feeling more like a warrior now. As long as I'm here, I'm, it's the American dream. Yeah, yeah. America forgot what it was supposed to be doing. But I remember. So this is the worst part right here. Just, you know, like being on the 405 right here where it kind of merges with the 101 and then when it starts to, you know, go more south through the Getty Center and uh, into the Wilshire District, 
that territory. That just kind of it really gets me because right here you feel like you're bottlenecked in, and like you know, there's people over there that somebody can post if they really didn't like other people. It's a tactical advantage for the enemy. This place is, I mean, a lot of casualties can happen here, and it's just you know, all it takes is one asshole to go up there and you know, make people's lives a hell. I only did one tour in Iraq. I invaded, and uh, I mean, like everybody that was in my fire team is is gone now. They died either coming home or serving in Ramadi the second time. These guys were all guys that had just extraordinary futures laid out for them. Yeah, I mean, it, in some sense, I feel like I betrayed them because I didn't go back with them that guilt just starts to set in. And um, I felt this urge to still help. Uh, my service was not done. And uh, I, I couldn't let my brothers down. You just gotta live your life wholly and fully and peacefully. And you gotta show that that is possible. And that's how you honor them. The things I, I really honed in on to help me heal were simple things like planting your own vegetables and building, you know, simple things. Your dog, feeding him. Daily tasks that are routines that bring you so much joy. You know, cooking and loving food and, and loving how a community works, especially the folk scene, you know, the, the, folk, the folk communities where people are sharing music and food and stories. Those things really kind of give me a sense of purpose and a sense to move on. Like ragtime, he's reached the farthest stage uh, of healing, I mean, that you can probably possibly reach. He's found his inner peace. Um, he knows he has to live with the tragedies uh, in his life, but he doesn't dwell on them. That is, uh, in my eyes, it is attainable. I know it is. I know it is because I know I have support from other veterans. A lot of guys, they just get out and they're, they're really lost, you know? And there's other things that need to happen, obviously, at the local level to help veterans heal more holistically. The work's not done. This war is gonna keep going on and we need to keep welcoming these guys home and getting them the services they need. And the government can't do that. The government can provide infrastructure but it can't, it can't touch down at a local level, at a grassroots level. It just can't. You need empowered veterans to empower other veterans uh, to do these things. So Matt Lorscheider, he was a uh, he was a Marine Infantry man from uh, Fox Company, 2nd Battalion, 5th Marines. Uh, after that, he went to college, got his bachelor's, and followed by a master's degree, and uh, now has uh, decided to help homeless veterans with the uh, New Directions program. So we're going to go pay him a visit right now and get a little bit of, uh, of uh, information on what he has to say about it and uh, what he's been doing since he's been out of the Marine Corps. The veteran population we work with is 100% homeless. One doesn't become homeless because they have excellent job skills for the most part. Um, so we're addressing the statistics that, you know, probably 98% of our population could use some retraining in those skills. There is a correlation between companies that have a reputation for bad customer service and companies that pay low wages and give them not a lot of hours and don't pay benefits. And those things are connected. I first came to work here because I wanted to do something that helped my fellow vets. And it, just like it made a big difference to me when I was working with people and they were or weren't vets. You know, I, when I was trying to talk to somebody about my situations and they weren't a veteran, no matter how much they tried to say, oh, I work with veterans all the time, or oh, my, you know, my husband's a vet, or my cousin's a vet, or my uncle's a vet, it's not the same. It's not the same as if you haven't really done it. 
it gives me a certain level of legitimacy when dealing with combat veterans and combat arms veterans that have, that have been in that kind of stuff where I can say, you know what, you know, I've had people shooting at me too. You know, I've, I've shot people. I know what that's about. There's a, a kind of a trend going on right now, and it's been going on for a few years, where guys are getting kicked out of the military, you know, they basically act out with rage related to PTSD, or they start using drugs to self-medicate, or they start using alcohol to self-medicate. And when they get kicked out on OTHs, on other than honorable discharges, they lose their entitlement to VA healthcare, including healthcare and mental health care, for the very conditions that got them kicked out, conditions that were started because they served in combat. That's absolutely criminal to me, because they're putting a whole generation of veterans directly into the streets by doing that. It needs to stop right away. And you can print that, you can tell that to Congress, you can tell that to Obama, whoever's in charge, like that needs to stop yesterday. No matter where my career takes me, you know, I know it's going to be doing something that benefits veterans and, and society. You know, I, my desire to serve my country and all that didn't end the day I, you know, got my DD-214. My purpose is I want to help people and I'm starting with people like me, other veterans, you know, veterans that, that maybe didn't take advantage of their opportunities the way I did or, you know, guys who were just struggling and, and need a hand. That's what we did in the military. You know, that's what we did in the Marine Corps. You know, you helped a buddy out. I'm not going to stop doing that now. You know, once a Marine, always a Marine. That's what it's all about for me. It gives me a great deal of hope to see the Marines I served with, Marines I didn't serve with, uh, warriors from all different branches starting these small organizations to help one another. That's the potential here, and that's what's happening. As we empower each other as veterans, and then we start bridging the gap with civilians again, and all these people are empowered, and they all are so happy to help, and they're so willing to work. Uh, it's like, it just spreads like wildfire. Although we all have our issues, and make no mistake, going to combat, you don't come home the same. But to see them going forward in spite of that gives me immense hope, and for the sake of hope, we have to keep doing this. We had uh, did the run, you know, the, the couple hundred mile running gunfight to Baghdad. And then uh, after we secured Baghdad, uh, I guess the forces, you know, the U.S. forces kind of spread out across the country. Um, my unit, we were tasked in the uh, Babylon province. So we were down by, you know, the ruins of Babylon. And of course, while we were there, we would do a lot of counter ambush patrols. We'd go out in the city and basically, you know, try and elicit a response, um, you know, from the, from the enemy fighters that, you know, were in the... Uh, that were out there kind of waiting. And um, we were uh, headed out of the city um, on one of the routes and uh, they had five 120 millimeter tank rounds uh, daisy chained together and wired to a car battery laying off the road. And so the, uh, the Iraqi or foreign fighter, whoever it was, you know, waited until we you know, rolled up on the IED and then uh, set it off when it was right next to our tire. That was the first IED attack for our unit of the entire war. Luckily, they weren't very good at it then. You know, nobody was seriously injured, um, but it was it was mainly the blast wave. You know, as that blast passes through your brain, you know, it, it, it can do some serious damage, you know, long-term damage. Um, and at the time, you know, in 03, they didn't understand uh, blast wave injuries, you know, traumatic brain injury as well as they do now. Um, had that happened today, you know, I'd spend the next 30 days in a dark room, you know, resting the brain and giving it time to heal. Um, but back then, you know, um, I wasn't missing any limbs, you know what I mean? And the next day we're out on patrol doing it again.
when we got out of the Marine Corps, Kenny and I stayed in touch. Um, he was someone who I always held as a, as a close friend. And it was very difficult um, because I knew him before Iraq. So I knew the happy-go-lucky kid, the guy that was just overall an up spirit type of person. And so when we came back, you know, it was, it was pretty obvious that he was struggling and having some problems. About 10 years after getting back from Iraq and going through the VA, you know, going through the process of being treated for post-traumatic stress, my doc had uh, prescribed a service dog. He said, you know, I think a uh, service dog would be the next best stage treatment for you in your post-traumatic stress. And so, you know, I started going through the process of trying to find an organization to work with. Um, the VA doesn't um, provide them uh, or pay for them, so, you know, basically I was on my own. Um, just like any other vet, you know, that's going to be trying to figure out where to get a service dog. My best option turned out to be um, going with an organization that wasn't a nonprofit that actually charged me $15,000 for Atlas. And, you know, being a disabled Marine on disability, you know, and having that, uh, that fixed income, you know, I understand that most other vets uh, in my position, you know, they're just not going to be able to afford that. I call him, I'm like, what is, what are you talking about? You know, why does a dog cost $15,000? I knew he was service connected 100%, um, so I said, why isn't the VA paying for this, you know, and what is this all about? So during that initial conversation, when he's explaining to me how um, this dog is helping him and what the dog can do for him, it was a, a pretty significant moment in my life that I remember because I knew that that was going to be a fantastic opportunity to help other veterans. I was trained to, you know, turn it on. I was trained to turn on that kill switch. I was, I was trained to uh, thrive in combat and survive. Um, but the problem comes back is when we come back stateside, you know, and we take that uniform off and we, you know, take the weapons to the armory and you go back to your house, you know, and you go back to your wife um, and you go back to that civilian setting, we're not trained to turn it off. We're not trained to turn off that hypervigilance, those survival instincts that we have that were reinforced and honed depending on how long you were there and how close you know you came to dying while you were there. my battle buddy, I'll take him to the mall. You know, I take him out to these public places, you know, all the places that I spent years avoiding. And so over time, it's it essentially has become that retraining, you know, allowing me to, uh, I guess, basically reintegrate myself back into that civilian world. Atlas has definitely been a life changer for me. He's got different tasks that he's trained to do. He's trained to wake me from nightmares. So, you know, if at 3 a.m., you know, I'm sweating and, you know, cussing in Arabic, he'll jump up on the bed, you know, and either lay on me or lick my face and wake me up. You know, there's different things he can do where he'll post, you know, turn around and face behind me. And so I'm not hyper vigilant or I don't have to be, you know, as on alert as, you know, I had been for years. You know, there's all sorts of things that they can be trained to do that, that really just help increase that quality of life on a daily basis, help mitigate, you know, some of those symptoms that would keep you from doing things. I'd actually been looking for a charity to get involved with, and I came back to him and I said, hey, what do you think about you know, starting a charity uh, you know, together, the two of us, and helping other vets do this? And you know, he said, there's nothing I'd rather do. And, and that was it. And uh, his brother John came on board, and the idea was, was born. there's a need in that veteran community. There's a great need. And when I looked for that help, it wasn't there. I sincerely believe that we're gonna be one of the biggest organizations that there ever were for veterans. I don't see why we shouldn't be. We're not looking at just sending veterans away for a weekend, you know, or, you know, helping them catch up on bills for a month and then say, you know, good luck. We hope the rest of your life's better. 
When these veterans commit to getting a Battle Buddy through the Battle Buddy Foundation, and when they commit to becoming a part of this program and a part of this family, um, it's for life. When it comes to life after combat, there are no unobtainable goals. It blows me away because I, you know, I get vets that look at me like I'm some kind of example or something, and I'm like, brother, man, I got the same nightmares you do. You know, I've got the same, you know, sins and the same struggles, you know, and the same torment on the inside, you know, that you do. But instead of spending my days hiding in the garage, you know, thinking about it, now I've got no time. I ain't got no time for that. The most exciting thing about the situation we're in as veterans right now is the potential. If you can go take Ramadi at 18 years old with your friends, you can do anything. You can start a program. You can have the biggest program in the country. Why not? There's value in walking that dark path and, and surviving. You know, there's value in just being there for your brothers and sisters. Positive ripples just make positive tsunamis, you know? <laughs> it just keeps getting bigger and bigger. I don't think it's reaching to say that 100% of people that have been in combat have one buddy that they can still reach out to, no matter how far down the line they go. Call that person, tell that person what you're going through. They might be going through the same thing. You know, they might need you as much as you need them. We're all in this together and um, we swore an oath and that oath just never dies. If I could have a voice to most veterans, it's just, it gets better, man. I think vets really need to help vets and let them know, dude, it's gonna be all right. Can you imagine a company of Marines, an entire company of Marines, the greatest fighting force in the world, all dedicated to doing good for the rest of their lives? There's no, there's no ceiling on that. They could go to the moon. I mean, it's crazy. So we need to spread this positivity because it's out there. People are doing it. Um, and I just think that story needs to be told. We're going to wrap. I want to ask you if there's anything you want to say that we haven't said. Any grand statement you want to make. Anything. Not really. I mean, I said everything. Cool. I don't have a grand statement. I never did. <laughs>